Chapter 14 Counting My Blessings On that first Sabbath, when I was about to leave the Adventist Church Sanctuary, I asked the Lord to make it possible for me to find myself there again next week. And when I returned, I raised my heart to God in thanksgiving for His having worked in my behalf in the days just past. In fact, the whole day was one of rejoicing in the Lord and of counting my blessings. I then found by experience that great benefit to be realized by a person reviewing or counting his blessings. The commandment to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy I perceive to have been given in order to make it possible for man to escape the constant demands of the temporal affairs of life, and thus have the time to count his blessings, and in that way be brought closer to the Creator, and be refreshed both physically and spiritually. After my confrontation with the spirits, and life for me had taken on a new normal pace, I immediately turned my attention to searching out in ecclesiastical and secular history how the Christian church had become involved in Sunday observance, had given up the observance of the biblical Sabbath, and had adopted such doctrines as the immortal soul and eternal torment. For a period of five months I spent almost all my leisure time at the Municipal Library of Montreal. With great interest I read the writings of the Roman Catholic Church in the light of Bible prophecy. I looked into the lives of certain saints considered pillars of the early Catholic Church and examined their influence on Christianity. The history of popes took on a new meaning. Origen of Alexandria, an early Greek church father living between the years of A.D. 185 and 254, who succeeded in uniting some of the philosophies of the eclectic schools of Neoplatonists with the doctrines of Christianity especially fascinated me. That period of research and study served to solidify my belief in the Bible. One beautiful Sabbath day in April of 1947, I had the blessed experience of being baptized by immersion into the membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. On that same day, I met a young woman named Hilda Mousseau. As some of us were leaving the church after the evening meeting, Pastor Taylor stated that anyone headed east could ride a couple of blocks with him to the place where he was going to park his car for the night. Four of us accepted his offer, and after reaching the pastor's destination, started for the nearest streetcar stop. In that way, Hilda and I became acquainted, and a number of times after that walked to the streetcar together. It wasn't long before we found that we had common interests, likes, and dislikes. After a while, we found ourselves going steady. One day, I thought it would be a good idea to try to convince her that she should become my wife. In those days, it was a major project for a fellow to ask a young woman to marry him. He had to consider what would be the right place and time. Reviewing my plan of action a number of times, I set my sights on a particular Sunday evening. The important question would have to be brought up under relaxed conditions. An ideal time to ask would be while we waited for the night watchman to come and unlock the door for Hilda. It always took two or three rings for the man to arrive, amounting sometimes to ten minutes, depending on how far away he was in the building. Hilda was then working as a nurse at the Montreal Convalescent Hospital, and resided in the nurses' quarters of the hospital. All resident nurses had to be in by 11 p.m. The closer one returned to that time, the shorter the wait. Therefore, I figured 10.30 would be ideal. It was a beautiful June day. As planned, we had an enjoyable Sunday afternoon and evening together, culminating in a tour of the city of Montreal in an open streetcar. After each stop, as the tramway car would pick up speed, Hilda's long blonde hair would raise from her shoulders and float in the breeze, and her blue eyes would sparkle as they reflected the light of the many neon signs along the street. The more I looked into her face, the more convinced I became that her name should be Hilda Geraldine Morneau. About 10.30 that evening, we approached the entrance of the nurse's residence, and like many times before, Hilda pressed the bell button and kind of leaned her shoulder against the door in expectation of the usual long wait. Immediately, I asked her whether she would consider marrying me. No sooner had I spoken the words than the watchman appeared. Unlocking the door, he walked back about ten paces folded his arms and stared at me with an air that seemed to say, I dare you to give her a good night kiss in my presence. Both my question and the quick arrival of the usually slow-moving watchman took Hilda by surprise. She stated that she had thought about the matter and had expected that it might take place in the distant future. Now I assured her that all I was looking for at the moment was a yes answer and that we would discuss it later at a time more convenient for her. 
No sooner had I said that than the watchman barked out, Young lady, are you coming in, or do you want to stay out there? I got work to do, and if you don't come in, I will lock the door with you out. She gave me a quick yes, a peck of a kiss, and rushed in almost in tears. I'm going to teach you girls that when I unlock the door, it's for you to come in then, the man snapped. It's not every night, she replied, that a girl is asked by a fellow to marry him. The watchman looked startled. I'm sorry, he said. Why didn't you tell me it was that important? I would have given you more time. Hilda determined then and there that she was moving out. Her mother had an apartment on Queen Mary Road, and Hilda decided to live with her regardless of how far she would have to travel to work. At the same moment, I headed home feeling foolish that my timing had been so way off. As soon as Hilda could reach a phone, she called her mother to inform her of her plans. Mother, I have something wonderful to tell you. You do? What is it about? I am going to get married. Are you out of your mind? You're only twenty-one. Besides, whom are you going to marry? I'm getting married to Roger, that young man from church who I have been going out with. You know, the one you met a couple of times. Yes, but you have known each other only a short while. Aren't you rushing things a little? Then, according to Hilda, the fountain of tears let loose and she began to cry her heart out. The conversation closed by her mother saying there was no need of crying. They would talk things over when they got together. The next evening, when I called Hilda, she informed me of her mother's viewpoint on the subject. I suggested that we both go and visit her mother on the coming Sunday, and I would ask her for Hilda's hand in marriage. We would discuss the important matter with her and work things out to a satisfactory conclusion. It turned out that her mother was quite understanding concerning our intentions, and we chose the evening of September 20 for the wedding. It wasn't long before summer gave way to autumn, and the latter sought to outdo its predecessor in warmth, beauty, and charm. I rose early the Sabbath morning of our wedding day to discover all of nature vibrant with life. By the time we came out of church after the morning services, the thermometer had reached eighty degrees. A few dry leaves floated in the gentle breeze. Friends of ours by the name of Ruth and Arthur Cheeseman opened their home to us for the wedding ceremony. We planned it to be a quiet occasion, with only a few close friends attending. Among the guests were two SDA clergymen and their wives, André Rocha, minister of the French Church, and L. W. Taylor, minister of the English Church, who officiated at the ceremony. Mrs. Cheeseman, Mrs. Mousseau, and the other ladies had beautifully arranged the home for the occasion. As my bride and I repeated our marriage vows before the pastor, I stood tall and straight, not to impress any of the friends present, but because of the many invisible beings looking on, angels who had come from the presence of the Almighty to rejoice with us, and demons, commanded, I believed, to attend by their heartless leader, who had seen their diligent efforts turn into failure, when by the grace of the Lord Jesus I had walked out of their ranks. Besides, I was wearing my best suit, that tailor-made one I had bought with the money I had acquired playing the horses with the aid of the demons. 